Hey, Courtney. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Got a couple attendees here. See folks trickling in. While everyone is settling in, I'd like to go ahead and make a quick disclaimer before we begin. Um, none of this content is going to, is considered to be professional or financial advice. Bitwave and Hashbasis are not responsible for any decisions that you make based on any information that we share today. So please do your own research, make educated financial decisions, and consult your financial advisor. And we would love for you to drop questions in the Q&A box throughout the webinar. Um, that should be at the bottom of your Zoom. And if we have time, we'll pick some of our favorites at the end and answer those. So I'll just give everyone a couple minutes. Give some shout outs. Hi, Corey. Hi, Sapraja. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> I know these names. Hi, everyone. Happy Friday. I think this is going to be a really fun session. Oh, we already have a Q&A. Oh, it's Corey saying hi. Hi, Corey. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Here. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for hopping in. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Welcome to our session today, everyone. This is our second session of the monthly series, Crypto 101, First Principles, where we'll be speaking with industry leaders in the Web3 financial space, sharing real world knowledge, best practices, and experience. Uh, my name is Jenny, and I'm on the solutions team here at Bitwave, and I am a CPA turned crypto enthusiast, um, then a crypto enthusiast turned NFT project creator, and while I was immersed in that NFT space, I saw the pain points and the lack of resources that my community had with crypto accounting. So I became really passionate about bridging the gap between crypto and accounting. And that's what brought me here to Bitwave, where I'm part of a super passionate team building the top enterprise crypto accounting platform that does all of the heavy lifting for your on-chain bookkeeping. Um, I would love to start with a quote that I found from a blog about startups, which I find is actually really relevant to the crypto industry as a whole. So here it is. Uh, Many believe that they have to be an expert in order to lead something, but I found that no one can truly be an expert in the face of rapid scale, and pretend pretending to be one leads to far worse outcomes. All too often, people are so worried about sounding smart, so many important conversations aren't had because people are so afraid to seem dumb, but in rapidly growing startups, one has to value a willingness to learn, evolve, and sound like a moron more than established experience or deep expertise. So asking the right questions and learning to figure it out together is actually the most important muscle to develop. Hashtag wag me or we are going to make it. <laughs> so I, I'd love to practice sounding like a moron here with you today and developing that learning muscle with our amazing guest teachers. We have Mackenzie Patel and Courtney Paul, who are founders of the crypto native accounting firm Hash Basis. So Courtney and Mackenzie, I'd love for you to give a brief introduction of yourselves and Hash Basis. Sure. Thanks for the intro, Jenny. I also love that quote. I think it's super apt, especially in the crypto industry. So hi, everyone. I'm Mackenzie Patel. I'm CEO and co-founder of Hashbasis, your crypto native accounting firm. We help implement subledgers for all the crypto enterprise businesses out there and also do monthly crypto bookkeeping in addition to doing crypto taxes for individuals. So we kind of run the gamut there. Uh, before founding Hashbasis, I was actually leading up crypto and revenue accounting at Figment, which is a validator on over 50 proof of stake blockchains. And before that, I was doing revenue accounting at Honeywell. So that's a little bit, a little bit about me. And Courtney, I'll pass it off to you. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Courtney, co-founder of Hashbasis. Um, just want to say, Jenny, thanks again for having us on. This is so fun. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, I love wandering in the woods or going on hikes or playing games with my husband and my kids. 
And a little background on how Mackenzie and I met. Um, we met at our former employer almost two years ago, where our love for crypto and numbers resulted in immediate connection. And it's just kind of blossomed since then. Amazing. Thank you so much for that introduction. <laughs> okay, so I want to get into why this training is called Crypto 101 First Principles. So I, I found that with crypto accountants and crypto bookkeepers, um, we've all sort of been tiptoeing online into this new and very exciting space in the past few years. And I've noticed that while we have a good grasp of uh, what, if any, accounting principles and standards might need to be applied, and an understanding of the regu regulatory tax impl impl implications, there seems to be a disconnect in the understanding of the mechanics of the new tech that is emerging in the crypto industry. I think there's an opportunity here for us to bridge the gap in understanding. Um, the whole premise for this training series is around first principles. So what are first principles? Well, we're trying to take this vast and complex topic of crypto, which encompasses blockchain, Web3, stablecoins, metaverse, DAOs, DeFi, NFTs, all this terminology, right? We're trying to reduce that down to the most fundamental building blocks. I think when something is inherently complex, uh, we need to start simplifying it so that we can understand it. And over these monthly conversations, because we're going to be doing these, these sessions monthly, hopefully we start to have a clearer and clearer understanding of the most basic principles of the crypto ecosystem. Because once we know the fundamentals, we can use that to build more complex mental models. So that leads me into my first question, which I would love to ask the Hashbases team. In your opinion, what are the first principles of crypto? Yeah, definitely. I can take that one on. And I just want to emphasize that learning first principles is kind of an ongoing and iterative process. Like even prepping for this webinar, I was watching some basic like what's a blockchain one on one videos because you have to constantly remind yourself like what this technology is because it's pretty complicated. Um, So even if you've been in the space for a couple of years like we have, it's still good to get back to basics to just refresh your refresh yourself. So I guess just to start off the principles of crypto, I um, just want to set the context a little bit. So Crypto was actually born out of the 2008 financial crisis, where there's a lot of widespread distrust. People didn't trust the banks. They were failing. There were bailouts. And so it was just not a very good climate um, for trust. And so blockchain was really kicked off by the Bitcoin white paper, which as you might know, Satoshi Nakamoto published um, in 2008. We still don't know who, who, she, they, whatever they are, not quite sure who they are. But and so it's really cool that there's just like mystical legends surrounding like the whole founding of Bitcoin and blockchain. And so when I was thinking about what are the first principles, I, I really was thinking about the Bitcoin white paper and what were some of the principles that were espoused in there. So I really think that has served as like the, the ground for the rest of the blockchain and crypto industry and kind of served how it's or guided how it's developed um, over the last decade um, and more. So I think some of the highlights that I just want to hit, the first one is the centralization. You probably have heard that term a lot. It is kind of a buzzword, but I still think it's a really important first principle of crypto. So that means no one centralized party is really controlling the system. Um, and I'll contrast that to the more traditional financial systems where there's usually a centralized party or an intermediary such as a bank. And so they really have control, but blockchain is supposed to be more decentralized. Everyone is on more equal footing. Financial records are dispersed amongst multiple parties and multiple people all over the world. So I think that's a, a really big and a, a really revolutionary one that blockchain technology is actually able to enable. Now, the second one is, is privacy. So, and this one, I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword because when you transact on chain, I guess one of the one of the original ideas was that your identity is supposed to be anonymous, right? Like you have this blockchain address and it's a string of alphanumeric characters and no one's supposed to know who you are. Now, as we've seen, blockchain isn't entirely anonymous. I would actually call it more pseudonymous because the, the, the technology has developed and there's companies like Chainalysis, which can actually trace your identity from your on-chain address. Because um, if you use anything like an exchange, for example, where they KYC you, then it will be possible to get your identity. But I still think it's still important to mention sort of that anon anonymity, privacy, things like that. Um, it's why, you know, Bitcoin was used on the Silk Road because people thought it was anonymous. And so just one example there. So some other principles, immutability and security. I actually think this one is really cool because blockchain makes it really difficult to tamper with earlier records or to alter records in the past. And so what you're left with is this immutable or non-changing record of what has happened in the past. And you think about it, like that's pretty revolutionary, right? Because like maybe in a more traditional system, someone could like alter a journal entry here or there and no one would be any the wiser. 
But in blockchain, because of the way the technology works, which we'll get into in a second, you can't really do that. Or it's very easy to tell if, hey, someone's messed with something. So, you know, prevents bad actors from maybe stealing money or more fraudulent activities occurring. And if they do occur, you'll know. And people can be like, that is a bad actor. And, you know, exclude, exclude that party. Another one is transparency. Really love this one. And so blockchains are public ledgers, right? It's a transparent record. I can, let's say I know somebody's blockchain address, or I can just search a random one. I can go to Block Explorer and see a list of all those transactions that that address has engaged in. And so it's really easy to see, you know, people's transactions, but also to get just a copy of whatever blockchain and see all the transactions that happen, see the balances that everybody has. And so an example I like to give is, let's say like, Elon Musk exposed all of his bank accounts, his credit cards, like his Fidelity account, you know, his Charles Schwab, whatever he has. Like, imagine if that was just all exposed and anyone in the world could just see that. Like, if you had all of his wallet addresses on a blockchain, then you you could see that. And so to me, that's like kind of mind-blowing that you can just, you know, go to Etherscan and see how much any like company that has an address has. Next one is trustless. Um, so I think it's really interesting that in this sort of decentralized immutable system, the parties that are interacting in it, they don't actually have to trust each other. And so contrast that to a bank, for example, you're trusting that they have your money. And as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, that might not always be the case. At least in the blockchain, you're, you're able to actually see, like, if someone's paying me or, or holding my money, like, do they actually have those assets? And so because of this new technology, um, actors can interact with each other without, like, knowing who they are and without needing to trust them. And then a few other ones, um, this is just kind of um, not really related to like the main principles, but things that I think are pretty cool is users can now go bankless. Like anyone that has a crypto address is their own bank. And I think that's actually like a huge development. And so, you know, users can custody their own assets. They can access financial services and something called DeFi, which we'll get into. So it's possible as a person to have true financial freedom now. Now, of course, that comes with risks. Now you're self-custodying your own assets. Which, you know, if you forget your your wallet or your private keys or something, then, you know, too bad. You're, you don't have your assets anymore. But on the good side, like, you have control of your of your money. And you know it, where it is. And no one can really take it from you. And then kind of off the back of that is economic innovation. And so, I, I mean, this is just my personal belief. But I think this blockchain technology will fundamentally alter our financial system and, like, completely change the rails. I think we're still in the really early days of this. But We've already seen so much economic innovation in things like, you know, DeFi and, and NFT marketplaces, like these fundamentally new things. And I, I think that's just one of the first principles of crypto is that we're always evolving, always changing and always building new things. And so I know that's kind of a laundry list, um, but those are, in my opinion, what I think are the first principles of crypto. No, that, that's absolutely perfect. I, I love this list of the first principles. I think if you are really just getting into crypto, and I know some account, accountants like are brand new to crypto. So mm -hmm. they they start off and it's it's easy for them to grasp how to account for crypto, but then to actually go in and understand the industry, it requires a little bit of digging, right? A little bit of research, mm -hmm. a little bit of that like getting into the weeds mentality. And this is really this is really the 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 goal of our training today. And I I'd like for um you guys to uh have like a teaching moment. We're going to do like a micro lesson. 20 to 25 minutes. I'd, I'd like to throw this back over to uh, you guys, hash basis, so you can. I know you pre prepared a wonderful presentation for us to really break down these basic concepts, so we can start deep diving into crypto. Sure. Let me go ahead and start sharing. Um, let me know if you can see this. All good. Yes. All good. Okay, awesome. So this is our micro lesson. Super excited to teach you all just some crypto blockchain 101. As I said, it was funny. Courtney and I were talking about this before and we had to like watch all these videos ourselves because we learned all this stuff years ago, but we're so focused on like the crypto accounting piece that it's easy to get siloed in that and not remember like the why or the fundamental technology behind all of this. So, all right, let's get into it. Here's our, there we go. Okay, here's our agenda for today. So we already covered the first principles of crypto before, so we'll just kind of breeze through that. Then we'll get into blockchain mechanics, like what exactly is a blockchain? And we'll dive into all about block explorer. So how can you actually tell what's happening on said blockchain? Then we'll get into proof of work versus proof of state consensus mechanisms. And then kind of a deep dive on that is staking in the validator ecosystem. And then some more high level where to purchase and where to store crypto if you're really new to it. And then use cases for crypto. So we have this technology, now what do we actually do with it? And then we'll open it up for, for questions as well. All right. So first principles, we already kind of covered that. 
All right, but I want to get into what exactly is a blockchain. I feel like it can be kind of confusing to understand what's actually happening, but it's actually not that bad. So imagine a blockchain as a decentralized network of servers, right? Where everyone has a copy of the same ledger. Because that's what a blockchain basically is. It's a peer-to-peer -peer distributed ledger of transactions. And so in my mind, I find it easiest to think of just think of everyone has like a server, but they're all distributed. Maybe somewhere in the United States, maybe somewhere in Europe, but everyone has the same copy of what's actually going on, like the transactions. Everyone has the same copy of the ledger. And I really want to emphasize that because that gets back to the decentralized first principle that we were talking about before. Everyone, if they're running the software code, like they have the same copy. And so a blockchain lets you submit transactions. So let's say I'm a user and I want to send one Bitcoin, uh, the ticker is BTC, from myself and I want to send it over to Courtney. And so we have miners or validators, which are just the, the servers that I just mentioned in this system, servers running software. And they're basically gonna take these transactions that people are submitting and group them into blocks. So just think of a block as a group of transactions. So I'm sending one Bitcoin to Courtney. Let's say Courtney is sending 0.5 Bitcoin to one of our coworkers. They're sending it to Jenny, et cetera. So a block is just a nice neat package of all these transactions. But the cool thing is that all of these different blocks are connected via hashes to the previous blocks that came before it. And so that gets back to the immutability principle that I mentioned before. If someone tries to tamper with any of the transactions in the previous block, because it's linked to all the other blocks in the chain, you're going to be able to tell if somebody messed with it. So in my mind, the, the work kind of describes it. I just imagine a bunch of blocks with transactions and they're all linked to each other. And so the transaction, let's say in that example, I'm sending Bitcoin, it's being broadcasted. And so the miners and validators are trying to, they're racing, right? They're trying to package these transactions into blocks and execute the block, which then gets added to the blockchain. And so that's kind of how I think about it. But when you're really like distilling it, boiling it down, just think servers are running ledgers and people are submitting transactions that will change the state of the ledger. And so I have a YouTube link there and I highly recommend checking this out. I can post this um, in the, in the uh, chat later, but it really just breaks blockchain down to its essence. And it goes through like the transaction hashes, the nonces, how each block is connected to the one prior. And so like I watched it again last night. It was like, oh, like that's a blockchain. I also just love this graphic so much. Like <laughs> I could just send Bitcoin to Courtney. I'd also go through a bank. That's why there's a big X on there. So just want to shout that out. All right. Yeah. Next, we'll talk about block explorers. What is a block explorer? So very basically, just think of a block explorer as a Google for blockchains or even breaking it down further, a place to explore data on a blockchain. So like Mackenzie just mentioned, these transactions, these sends on a blockchain can be, be viewed via block explorers. So instead of going to Google and searching what is a block explorer, you can go to a block explorer and enter a wallet address or a transaction hash and find data relating to that address. So this data might consist of sends, receives, um, maybe balances of your address that it could include liquid balances. So what you hold in your wallet that is available to spend. Um, maybe staked balances or staking rewards balances. Um, it's just a way to, it's used to verify transactions and movement, crypto movement. Um, one thing to note about these block explorers is they are created by various different people and or companies. So just do your due diligence and understand where this data is actually being pulled from and if it is reliable data to use. Mm -hmm. And if you're a crypto accountant, uh, like, like we are, your life will pretty much be a lot of block explorers and trying to figure out all the data and piece it together. But definitely um, totally agree with you, Courtney, that you really have to be careful what data you're pulling because it might not always be accurate, but that's part of the fun of crypto accounting. So, okay, the next part that we want to get into is consensus mechanisms or consensus algorithms. You might have heard this term a lot. And so blockchains can fall into, there's pretty much like two different consensus mechanisms. There's a few other ones that we, we cover in this other bucket over here. But the two main ones are proof of work or POW for short, and then proof of stake, POS for short. And so just think of a consensus mechanism as an algorithm that determines how a given blockchain will reach consensus about its current state. And so basically do all of the miners, which are in a proof of work system or validators in a proof of stake system, do they all agree on the current state? Like, do they agree that the proposed transactions are legitimate? And so it's just an algorithm that's developed. Every blockchain's got one. And so it's also important to know that these consensus mechanisms, uh, part of the reason they're put in place is to prevent double spending 
because all of either the miners or the validators, they have to verify that everyone actually has enough money or crypto for these transactions to go through. So just think of it, it's a way to agree on the state of what's actually happening. And so on the proof of work side, as I mentioned, the main entity, so the servers running code um, are called miners. And so they're basically racing uh, to solve these complex math problems and whoever solves it first gets to package the transactions into a block and post it to the chain. And for doing all that work um, and a proof of work system, it costs a lot of money, a lot of electricity. Just imagine like giant servers worrying and try to like figure out the solution to problems. But whoever solves it first, uh, they get rewarded in the native token. So if I'm a Bitcoin miner and I solve the problem, I'm gonna get rewarded in Bitcoin. So that's how one system works, proof of stake, um, which we're seeing a lot of uh, chains either migrate to proof of stake or just they're built inherently on top of proof of stake. It's just a different type of consensus mechanism. The servers in this universe are, are called validators and validators are the ones they're validating transactions, making sure they're legit. And again, packaging these transactions into blocks and posting them to the chain, but it's not based on, on energy. The validators are usually selected based on like how much tokens, how many tokens are staked to their validator. And we'll cover that in a second. So it tends to be less energy intensive, which is really good, but validators do need um, a high amount of capital to kind of get in the game and be considered in the active set of validators. And again, when they post these transactions into blocks, uh, they're rewarded in the native token. There's some other consensus mechanisms like Helium, which is another blockchain out there. They have proof of coverage. Um, and then I think Solana has proof of reserve. So there's different ones, but they often are just variations on proof of work or proof of stake. And I really just recommend learning about those two main ones because that's what majority of them fall under. All right, so that's a consensus mechanism. And kind of diving a little bit deeper into that, I wanted to get into what exactly is a validator. So again, validator is a server, it's running code on a proof of stake blockchain. And so it's kind of in the name, they're responsible for validating transactions and adding new blocks to the chain. And again, validating transactions just means that all these transactions that people are submitting to be executed, do the people have enough money to actually send these transactions? Are these legitimate transactions? Are they fraudulent? Are they spam, et cetera? And so there's usually an active set of validators in any given proof of stake blockchain. And each blockchain tends to have different parameters on like what an active set actually means. But let's say you're in the active set, you're chosen as a validator to actually propose and post the new block Based on a number of factors, um, a big one is uptime. So are your servers always connected to the internet? Are they always up and running and looking at blocks that are being proposed or proposing new blocks themselves? And so that just means, does your server have like a good internet connection? Reputation, you know, have you, you know, double signed any blocks in the past? If so, that, that's pretty bad. You don't ever double sign. It's like a, a very big no-no for validators. Uh, what's your commission fee? And so, We'll get into this in a second, but when validators, they have tokens that are delegated to them, basically other users with tokens are voting or giving their stake weight to their validators and they're sharing in the pie of rewards that are earned. And so validator earns money by, by setting a commission fee. And so is their commission fee super high? Is it low? You know, that kind of depends on how much stake that they eventually get. And then of course, staked amount. The more amount of tokens that validators have staked to them, the higher the chances they have of being selected to propose a new block. And validators, again, they're just entities, but it can be individuals running this code. Let's say they spun up a server on AWS and or you know, DigitalOcean, any one of those um, Google Cloud, those sort of uh, virtual validators or virtual servers, or they can be organizations. Like we previously worked for Figment, which is a company that runs validators. So just kind of depends. And just to double click a little bit into the proof of stake ecosystem, of course, that's our that's our background, that's where we feel at home. And so I wanted to, of course, um, give it a shout out. And so just to kind of set the context a little bit more though, the point of a blockchain isn't to mine or validate transactions for rewards. Like the point is not for the validators or miners to just earn money. Blockchains actually usually have a specific function. Like there's a reason why these blockchains are built. Like on Ethereum, it's a smart contract chain. So you can deploy, deploy smart contracts. You can build your own decentralized applications or dApps for short. There's a proof of stake blockchain called Stargaze, which is an NFT marketplace. So you got Helium, which I mentioned the proof of coverage is like decentralized internet. And so I think for me, it was very easy working as a validator company to be like, oh, the main purpose is just to earn rewards, but it's not. All these blockchains, they have a purpose. They're doing something. And so this diagram here is just kind of like a high level overview of how a proof of stake system actually operates. And so we have transacting users. Again, um, let's say I have some Atom tokens, that's the Cosmos blockchain, and I wanna send them to somebody. 
So I'm going to propose this transaction. And then it goes into the pool of validators on this and validators are validating my transaction. Like, do I have enough Atom to actually send out? And I have some logos up there. There's a bunch of validators, again, companies, individuals. And once the block is actually packaged, it's broadcasted to the blockchain. And so you see all these different blocks that are related to each other. And then the protocol is giving rewards to both the validators and the delegators who are essentially splitting that pie of rewards based on the commission fee. And so that's a little bit of a deep dive, but yeah, definitely recommend researching this. Proof of stake is really interesting um, and more sustainable. All right. Okay. Recording? Yes, where to buy crypto. So there are several exchanges. Uh, we have three listed to highlight, and this list is not extensive by any means. Um, depending on where you're located, you might be limited on which exchanges you can purchase crypto from. But the first one that we're going to highlight is Binance, which is one of the largest exchanges. Um, they have a pretty friendly user interface and typically low transaction fees. Um, Binance also has their own coin or token, BNB, and that can be used to pay for transaction fees on uh, Binance Exchange. Um, the next one is Kraken, which is one of the oldest exchanges. Um, I believe it's been around since 2011, and they place a high priority on security, and they store their customer funds in cold storage and perform regular security checks. And then the last one to highlight, um, the last exchange to highlight is Coinbase, which is a well-known exchange. Um, they've been around since 2012, and they have a wide variety of cryptocurrencies for purchase. And you can also do other activities on their exchange, such as staking or participating in DeFi by lending your assets and earning more assets. Um, one of the cool things that I like about Coinbase is they have a learn to earn program, and it just involves um, watching short videos about different blockchains and taking quizzes on those videos. And then in return, you earn a small amount of that token. So I think it's a great way if you're just getting started to kind of, quote unquote, dip your toes in. Okay, so now we know where to purchase crypto, but how and where do we store it? Um, there's really two ways. You can either self-custody it or use a third-party custodian. And let's just start with self-custody. And the first one will be a hot wallet, such as MetaMask. And a hot wallet is connected to the internet and accessible via the internet. Um, a hot wallet is less secure because it is connected to the internet and is typically provided by uh, exchanges or online wallet providers. And the thing with hot wallets are they're typically easy to use um, and convenient because it is an extension of the internet. So if I am paying contractors uh, in crypto, it might just be easy to log into my hot wallet and send out crypto every single day but it is not the most safe or secure way to do, to hold or store your crypto. Um, the other way of self-custodying your assets would be a cold wallet, such as a ledger. This is not connected to the internet so and stored offline. So think of like a USB, you plug it in, you enter your password, and then you are able to transact. Um, this is definitely more secure and I would say ideal for larger holdings and or long-term positions. Um, and then the other way, the th third-party custodian that I mentioned, uh, such as Anchorage. And this is a, an opportunity if you are not comfortable with holding your assets, securing your assets, um, and or this is also an option typically geared toward enterprises or large companies with large amounts of crypto. All right. Okay, so let's get into some use cases. So we've been through what exactly is a blockchain, how do you buy crypto, how do you store it? But now what can you actually do with crypto? And so I just highlighted a few use cases here. I think the first one and the most obvious one is just payment. So the fact that I can send money across borders globally at any hour of the day and it'll get there in like five minutes, probably less than that is actually kind of amazing. And so I think payment's definitely like the biggest use case. And I think we're, we're still sort of, trying to get that to be mainstream like some countries especially ones that maybe don't have a very strong currency like they realize the the potential and the potency of the payment use case but I think other countries are still kind of catching up to this but yeah I can send crypto to anyone in the world if they have an address and they'll get there super quickly the next one is store value so almost like crypto as an investment so 
we have we have the the gold bricks here because Bitcoin is usually touted as like digital gold. And so you can buy it, hold it, store it as an investment. And maybe it's an alternative to you know holding actual gold or, or any other type of investment. The third is DeFi, uh, which we mentioned. And so DeFi just stands for decentralized finance. So it's basically banking or or financial services that are outside the traditional realm. And so in this case, maybe we can self-custody your assets and then you can lend them, you can stake them, you can liquid stake them, you can liquidity provide them. And so there's just a lot of things that you can do out there to access financial services that is not through the mainstream. I think it's really powerful. You can like, you can buy crypto, you can lock it up and then you can take a loan out against it. And so I just think that's a very powerful uh, use case. The next one is file storage, which I think is a little bit outside of the norm. People don't normally think of file storage, but there's something called IPFS, which is Interplanetary File System. Yes, that is actually what it's called. And so it's a way for you to store your files uh, in the decentralized network. So as I mentioned, blockchains are just decentralized ledgers, decentralized servers, and there's a way which you can kind of divvy up those files and store them in these decentralized locations. And then the fifth one is just NFTs, which I'm sure you've heard the term, definitely a buzzword, but it's actually really cool. They stand for non-fungible tokens. And so it's a unique piece of the blockchain that you have. So right now it's a lot of it's geared towards artists, like uh, paintings, music, things like that. But there's also, I think, a whole universe of use cases that we still have yet to realize because you can put any unique records on chain and they can have an NFT. And it's like, this is, this is your NFT. This is your piece of the chain. And so these are just some early use cases. I think we still have a long way to go, especially with use cases that are fully crypto native, but also serve like a real, they solve a real problem um, in the real world. So those are some main use cases. And yeah, with that, I guess, Jenny, do you want us to take questions now or maybe have them hold off until, until the end? If we have some questions right now, um, feel sure. free to drop do them we? in the Q&A. But if not, we can keep moving along. Yeah. Did we did we share the slide with like the resources? We I mean we'll send this presentation out so you have like oh that's a good resources. idea. Yeah, no, yeah. actually let me go ahead and do that. Yeah, I think that'll be really helpful. So yeah, we just have a couple of resources here that we'd recommend. Um, actually, the, the way that I first learned about crypto was reading the Bitcoin white paper and the Ethereum white paper. And so I think just reading those back to back and really parsing each sentence and trying to understand what was going on, it, it really helped me so much. So it's the last resource we'll be here, but I really think it's probably the most important one to go through. Um, I guess, Courtney, do you want to cover the rest? Sure. So whiteboard crypto, this was, this is a YouTube series that I found like super beneficial when I first got into blockchain. It kind of breaks down this complex topic into simpler, easy to understand terms. Um, and it's all via YouTube videos, short YouTube videos too. Um, she 256 has a great beginner's guide to what blockchain is. Um, it's an easy to read and it, it kind of breaks down even further. Uh, Hacker Noon and Bankless, I just, I like their newsletters. Um, they come right to my inbox. I can read them. They're reliable. They're relevant. Uh, just good resources to keep up on. Yeah, especially Bankless. I feel like there's some wild story in the headlines like every week related to crypto and I don't tend Absolutely. to catch up on it. So I just like read the Bankless headline and then like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think there's, and there's a ton more resources though. So. Oh, go ahead. I really like whiteboard crypto. When I was like starting off in my crypto journey, I started there because all the concepts that they they share with you, they just simplify everything. It's so simple to like pick up and I just like it's one video after another. And then I start like it's like 5 a.m. and I'm still watching crypto videos, <laughs> but they're fun. They're fun to watch. <laughs> they're great to rewatch too, just to keep up on and re refresh. Yeah, because I, I think it is very important as accountants for us to understand what we're accounting for. So just to start getting a grasp of like what is happening here in this transaction and going back to like, I love that you said blockchain explorers are the Google for blockchains like that analogy makes so much sense to me. And like that, that's where we're going to start, you know, with, with the transactions, we're going to go and see what's happening in the transactions, we have to dissect all these little pieces right so that I, I love that analogy because it works very well. Um, and then you also had mentioned like the purpose of blockchain. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. So I, I think the, the purpose and the nuance of these blockchains is got, what got me so excited and like getting like fully like diving into crypto, like this space 
at all. The first project that I got into was like seriously got into, not just like, okay, here's five, here's $500, here's $500. And they're like, I'm just trying to like make money off of these, <laughs> these like cryptocurrencies was uh, Cardano. So I, I think probably I will talk a lot about Cardano. You will, you can probably expect me to talk a lot about Cardano because I'm a big fan of it. But I, I found out because uh, my friend and I started a stake pool or, on Cardano. So like the validators that you were talking about, this, this makes complete sense to me now, just, just after so much time, like being in this space, the, the fees, a portion of those fees, I didn't realize there was a purpose. Like it actually goes into a treasury pool. And this is what's cool about Cardona. It's not every single blockchain that does this, but the fees, they get transferred into a, a treasury pool. And then anyone who owns a certain amount of ADA, they can actually vote on how those funds are going to be spent. And I thought that concept was so cool that, okay, the fees aren't going to a banker's pockets. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not going to, to a third party, right? And, and if they're going to a third party, you get to choose how that is being spent as a community. So there, there's something called like catalyst like funding and anyone can submit a proposal to have these fees allocated to them. So maybe there's like a coffee farmer who wants to start his business in Africa. He can actually submit a proposal and the community in this blockchain will actually decide if this person gets funded or not. And it, it's, when you talk about innovation, economic innovation, that's what's happening here. And like, that is so cool to me. That's what inspired me to get into crypto. I think there's a lot of new tech that's coming up. It's anything that you can imagine, like build it here in this space. So I'd like to move on to our questions and uh, Mackenzie and Courtney, I, I would love to know what inspired you to get into crypto. Mackenzie, I can go first if you would like. Um, so I, I think it all ties to my love for numbers. Um, I've always kind of been a math buff. And when I went into college, I was not 100% sure what, I, what, what field I wanted to go into. So I started in engineering. Um, my dad is an engineer, and I always found it very fascinating. But I learned very quickly during my first semester with my schedule that it just was not going to work out. So I fell back to my roots and I graduated with a bachelor's in accounting, but I knew when I graduated, I was not in the position to get my CPA. So I fell down the operations rabbit hole for the next 11 years. And um, we kind of acted as an intermediary between healthcare systems and insurance companies. And we would recover overpaid claims by insurance companies so I was still very much in numbers. It was just in a different capacity. And then uh, I think it was like around 2019, end of 2019, beginning of 2020, my husband and I started having conversations about crypto and blockchain again. And my husband had previously dabbled into crypto um, before that, but he was getting back into it, I guess. And we started conversating about it. And I was still so very clueless, but I was very intrigued. So my love for numbers kind of, I was tying my love for numbers to crypto and I started falling down rabbit holes and one rabbit hole led to another rabbit hole, which led me to Figment and McKenzie. And honestly, I've just kind of felt at home ever since. So I think it's like my love for numbers that had really drawn me to crypto. Yeah, I, I love that, Courtney. The, the number buff, I can totally relate to that. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess I was inspired to get into crypto because of, of a person, actually. So I have a friend whose name is Kenton, and he was working for MakerDAO at the time, which is a really big DeFi, a play in the DeFi space. And he interned there, even though he studied like engineering in college, he ended up interning there and starting there full time. So I basically did a 360 from engineering to, to finance, basically. And so he's working at MakerDAO, and he left to start his own DeFi protocol called Sense Finance. And so we just started talking a lot about crypto because he knew that I was, an, I was an accountant, but I wanted to do maybe more with my, with my career. And so he first introduced it to me, sent me a bunch of resources, and we would just talk about it a lot. And so that was kind of like my first introduction to it. And then I just did a lot of research on my own. Like I read the Bitcoin white paper or Ethereum white paper, and I was like, wow, this is so cool. Like blockchain's a ledger. I'm an accountant. I know ledgers. And so like the light bulb was just kind of like going off in my mind. And so that all happened. I was like, okay, like I want to get more into this, like get serious about it. 
And so I ended up starting this virtual community called Phoenix Crypto because I was living in Phoenix at the time. And it was a, a Codecademy chapter. They had this like chapter program. We could open a virtual community because this was all during COVID, right? So everything was just online. And so through this community, I was able to teach people basics of blockchain. And so by that, I had to like learn it myself really well and then teach other people. We had Discord community, we had a token, we had Decentraland wearables. It was like a real legit thing. It was so fun. And so I met a lot of cool people through there. Did that for like six to eight months. And I was still at my like my normal accounting job. And after that, I was like, okay, I think I'm ready to make the switch into crypto. And that's where um, I found Figment. I actually found my job at Figment through Discord, which is, which is really funny. Um, very like web three crypto native way to get your job. And so, yeah. And then I started working at Figment. Um, mm -hmm. I was just doing, I was doing fp &A work and a lot of rewards reporting, but I transitioned to the accounting team after about, I think eight months. And then that's where like the crypto accounting piece really got kicked off. But yeah, I mean, the crypto piece really just started with one of my friends and then I just got really into it. I, I love that. Can you, can you tell us how in more context, how did you go from normal accountant to crypto accountant? I would love to hear that. <laughs> yeah. So I guess I was honestly kind of bored at my, my, my normal accounting job. And so I, you know, after three months, I just got like very efficient at my job. And so I was just kind of not doing anything. And so I just started learning crypto a lot on the side and that wasn't even accounting though. I was just learning like blockchain basics. And so like the thing is crypto, I was learning blockchain 101, was learning how to program on the side as well. And so even when I was uh, looking for my job at Figment, I was chatting with them. I actually wanted to be a protocol researcher. So I didn't want to do anything with accounting. I kind of wanted to switch out of it. But then uh, the person I was talking to worked at Figment. She was like, oh, actually, they need somebody on the finance team. And I was like, okay, maybe I have a better shot of like getting into crypto because of my background on the finance team. And so then that's why I started working in finance. And then, I mean, I'm an accountant at heart though. So after like eight months, I was like, just trying to like get my way into the accounting team. And so that's how that happened. And then once I started like leaning all over crypto and revenue accounting, I feel like I really hit my stride and like found my niche. And I was like, oh, like I really, I love accounting. Like my love for accounting was really just sparked again. And I think it's because of like the crypto accounting piece is so fascinating. So I guess long answer, I was bored and I found something that was interesting. <laughs> that I relate to that so much because January, 2022, I was like so done with my job. I was like in traditional accounting, I was doing SEC reporting. And I was like, I just can't imagine doing this, waking up to do this every single day for the rest of my life. And I was like super into crypto at the time. So it, it was a nice little transition from doing that to like uh, getting into crypto. Um, so that leads me to my next question because you have just recently started Hashbasis, right? This is, this is a new crypto native accounting firm. Can you tell us the story of how that started? <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I, I think a big impetus for it was that I moved to San Francisco. So I was in Phoenix, then went back to Florida for a bit, and then moved out to San Francisco in January of 21. And, you know, San Francisco, it's a startup city. Like everyone has either, is either like working at a startup or they're starting their own one or they recently failed at one and they're trying again. So it's just, it's very pervasive. And so when I first moved here, I started going to a lot of crypto events. There's a really good meetup group called SF Blockchain Developers. And so it's at, it's at Atlas Cafe down the mission. So I started going there um, and just meeting a lot of the community and most of the people there, like it's, it's for developers. So I was meeting the people who are actually building protocols. And so I met a guy there and uh, we started talking about crypto accounting and he was just really hyping it up. He was like, crypto accountants are more rare than like smart contract developers. And I was like, yeah, okay. Cause everyone I was talking to, and I told them I was an accountant. They were like, wow, oh my God, like help me with my taxes. And so obviously I was like working at Figma at the time. So I was like, I can't, but like, great to know that you need my services. So I think that really got the seed planted in my mind. Like, oh, people actually like, they need this service. And, you know, I, I love Figma, but it was, I thought maybe I could use my skills to serve like the whole ecosystem. And so then, as I mentioned to you before, I had like a fever dream about hash basis, like, cause I had the idea I wanted to start something. And then I like, it, it was just kind of a dream. I was like, oh, I should call it hash basis. Cause like cash basis, cost basis, transaction hash. And so that's kind of where, where the name was born. And this was around like April, um, April of last year. And so, yeah, I had the idea in my head for, for quite a few months, actually, but I just, I don't know, I didn't want to act on it because I didn't have a business partner, which is where Courtney comes in. Um, we worked together at Figment really closely. And so one day I was like, hey, Courtney, do you want to quit our jobs and start a company with me? And um, I guess, Courtney, you can take it from there. <laughs> yeah, I, like like Mackenzie said, um, Figment was great. I learned, that, that was like where I really got into the weeds and learned so much. But 
I mean, it's, it's no secret. Mackenzie's amazing. So she came to me with this opportunity and I was like, oh yeah, let's do this. We're going to do this. Um, I definitely think there's a need for it. And we've, we're well-versed after what we've experienced at Figment and everything that we've learned. So it was, it, yeah, it just felt like home again. <laughs> Yeah, it was funny because like the day I asked you that night, you you texted me, you're like, I'm on board, my husband's on board, my kid's on board. And I was like, all right, everyone's like ready to go for this. So it was just really nice to have that that confirmation. And I wouldn't have been able to do this without a business partner. Like it's hard starting your own company. And if it was just my, by myself, like I wouldn't have even tried. So yeah, super glad to, to have Courtney and glad with everything. Glad to see how everything kind of happened. Yeah, and just to add on that too. So Mackenzie actually hired me onto Figment. And so I was working very closely with, with Mackenzie and obviously it's no secret. She's an amazing teacher. So everything I learned pretty much came from Mackenzie. And I was like, this girl knows her shit. Like, I can't believe everything that I've learned. And yeah, it just, it, it, we just kind of hit stride. I love this question um, that we got from Corey. <laughs> you guys hiring? I may have some people for you. <laughs> but no, seriously, crypto accountants are like unicorns, I think, in the space. For a while, I thought I was like the only crypto accountant out there. And now I'm finding this like community of crypto accountants who are using Bitwave, who are using all these other like platforms out there. I, I didn't realize, I knew there was a need, but I didn't realize how much of a need there was for bridging the two, crypto and accounting together. Um, okay, our next question, how much time do we have? We have 40, 15 minutes. Um, I think I'm gonna skip this question and I, I would really like to go to the next question after that. And how does accounting and crypto fit together? And how do you see crypto revolutionizing accounting? I think it would be really interesting to touch on this. Yeah, definitely. So what I mentioned before is blockchain is a decentralized ledger, right? And so I think for each, it's like very obvious how accounting fits because accounting is based on journal entries and there's ledgers, chart of accounts, like they're like one's just a more automated, like program, like programmable version of a ledger. And so I think that's just kind of like very like high level, like they both have ledgers. One's just, you know, more tech savvy. And like, I guess going even more high level, like crypto is basically programmable money. Like it's money plus plus programming that's what it is and so I think for me that was like a big part of the reason why I got into crypto was because I just saw those natural parallels I was like oh it's just transactions and I'm able to see them and then the next step is just like doing journal entries on top of that and so I, I think they they fit really well together um I have a, I have a note down here to talk about triple entry accounting <laughs> <laughs> definitely, get, definitely get into that so it's it's a buzz where you guys might have heard of it but it's just the concept that with blockchain, there's triple entry accounting, which is like debit, credit, and then the, the transaction hash. So you can see like the exact transaction, what it was, like when it happened. And so I guess in my mind, it's not it's not like a, a real concept, right? There's no, it's not debit, credit, and then some other entry there. Um, there's no debits and credits on a blockchain, but I do really like the idea of having transparency into a wallet and having transparency into those transactions. And so I guess kind of going off that, like crypto makes data, accounting data and finance data way more transparent. And so now that I have a complete view of the data, it actually makes the accounting for it a lot easier because I can see, oh, during this period, there were X amount of transactions. Do I have a journal entry for each one of those that I entered into my system? And so I, I think they actually go very hand in hand. I don't think blockchain is gonna like totally automate away the job of accountants, which I think that's a later question. So we'll get there, but I think they, they're very synergistic right now. Yeah, I, I do think that even in the future, even if AI takes over, they're going to still need accountants. So there, there is a use for us. <laughs> um, this question I'm going to save for later, but Courtney, I would love to have you share what are some day-to-day -day challenges that you experience and what are some, some pro tips that you have to solving those challenges? Yeah, I think the biggest one is just getting reliable data. Um, I know we touched on block explorers and how key they are, especially in our field, but there can be some really bad block explorers that you fall down into and you're not, you don't get the data that you actually need. Um, or you'll spend time parsing through JSON files just to find one data point. So I think getting the data, getting clean, reliable data is um, one of the biggest pain points that I face. Um, some advice would be to use extensions such as table capture so that you aren't manually copying and pasting all this data into other sheets. Um, another thing too, and it kind of goes hand in hand, is that I'm not a dev. I don't have a technical background really, but 
I have to think like a dev at times and also, also act like one um, just to get this data, just to extract it. Um, and then the last thing that I would say, and I'm sure this is not, I'm not the only one that feels this way, is there's just not enough hours in a day. Um, I think probably that's similar for others as well. But um, one, one way to handle that is just try to remove the distractions. Um, we obviously live in a very distractive world. And if you can just set aside or remove any distract, unnecessary distractions and just stay organized, um, that, that's my best advice with handling that. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely think you have to think creatively in order to get the right information. And even working with a, a platform that does a lot of that tooling for you, you, you still have to think creatively on how to organize the information, how to extract the right data from that and to do your accounting at the end of the month. It's, it's, it's challenging just innately, <laughs> just, just because there's, you're parsing through so much information. Yeah, um, you, you definitely need to think outside of the box, but that is kind of like the fun piece of it too. It's not just standard. You don't do the same thing every day, which makes it fun. Yeah. yeah. I think that's why we're here. We want the challenge. We want the, the, the difference in, in day to day. Um, speaking of challenges, um, I would also like to know what some challenges are of starting your own crypto native accounting firm. Mackenzie, could you take that question? Sure. Yeah, there's a lot. Starting your own company is hard, which I knew that going in, but yeah, it's it's tough, but it's also so rewarding. So on the crypto side, I think a lot of the challenge that we have is just understanding all the different crypto activity that's out there. So our background is Figment, right? So Courtney and I, we know protocol staking really well, but now we have clients that they're not just protocol staking, right? They might have NFTs. They might be doing like other DeFi. They might be Bitcoin miners. You know, they might be trading. There's just a lot more variety out there than I think we were initially used to. So we're just kind of like being thrown right back into the learning grind, you know, like trying to learn NFT 101. Like what are these marketplaces? Where are, where's pricing pulling from? And so I think just it's the breadth that's actually quite, that was quite challenging and it continues to be a challenge. But again, like that's the really fun part. Like I don't ever want to be stagnant. And so that's, it's hard, but it's, it's also really good. Um, kind of what Courtney mentioned, like balancing client work with all the admin tasks of starting your own company is is quite difficult. Just because I think crypto accounting work just tends to be more more time consuming than normal accounting work. So if you reconcile a bank, I you know I don't think that really takes that long because you just have a statement from the bank, right? But trying to reconcile a single wallet address could take you hours, if not days. And so I think just the scope we're talking about is just totally different, and it just takes a lot more time to kind of accomplish the same basic task in crypto right now because of the tooling and the data challenges that we mentioned. And so, yeah, it's you really have to learn how to balance your time between actually starting your company and servicing the clients that you do have. Um, also something that just kind of came up recently, getting insurance for a crypto business is really hard. It's like, we need to get professional liability insurance and it's really difficult to find someone to, I think to like underwriting your premium or to like sell a premium just because we're in a more risky industry. And I guess I wasn't expecting that because mm -hmm. we are uh, first and foremost an accounting firm, mm -hmm. but the fact that we call ourselves a crypto native accounting firm that suddenly like 10X is our risk. And so even just like getting coverage um, is, is tough, which I mean, to be expected, I just, I didn't think that really applied to an accounting firm. And then also one other thing that that is on top of mind actually is just like figuring out how our clients should pay us. Like, should we accept cash? Should we also accept stable coins, other tokens? Like I thought stable coins would be fine, but over the last couple of weeks, we've seen that deep pegging can just like happen out of nowhere. So I'm like, do I want to accept them? Like, and if we accept other types of crypto, then boom, we basically have like a whole treasury function on our hands now that we have to manage yeah. the risk for. And so it's like, are we ready to do that? So those are just some challenges. Um, there's probably a ton more, but those are like the main ones that have been top of mind. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about the insurance part, but for, right? for sure, yeah. And you know, I, yeah. I found it also very challenging to find a bank out there that will, once you tell them that you, you deal with crypto yeah. for them to take your business. So there are all yeah. these like, nuances and ch new challenges that you don't even think of when you get into this space. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question here that um, from Sarah, can reporting be live since all the transactions are on chain and transparent? That is a great or a great transaction, a great question, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the first thing I would ask is what reporting standards are you operating under? Um, operating under, because if you're US GAAP, you have to do accrued accounting. And one thing that's really important to know is that blockchain is all cash basis. 
right? There's sends and receives, but there's like, it's missing a link between like the accrual world. Like when are you actually earning revenue? When are you actually incurring an obligation to pay somebody? So if you're reporting under that, then no, that's where the accounting, like the accountants really come in because you have to be that bridge between the cash basis on chain and the US gap accrual world. But that's just one example. So I also do part-time accounting for a DAO, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Basically, it's an organization or an entity that uses blockchain for its operations. And so for us, um, we just have sends and receives, we're cash basis. And so it's much easier to get a live view of all, our, all of our transactions. I just hook up all of our wallet addresses and then I can just see data pulling in automatically. And so in that case, yeah, like it actually can be a little bit more, more live. And of course it's all on chain and transparent, but I think it really just depends like, like what, what reporting standards and, and who's also viewing your data. Like is it management and executives that might need to see accrual financials or is it just like down members that want to see how the cash flows of their treasury? So yes and no. Okay. I think we're getting near the end here. So I really wanted to get us wrapped up. Um, thank you so much for your time today, Mackenzie and Courtney. This was this is awesome. This is really fun. Of course. <laughs> this was a blast. It's like my this favorite is thing. So fun. Yeah. Where can you tell us where people can connect with you, where they can find you? Sure. So our website is hashbasis.xyz. So you can find us there. You can either there's like a place where you can sign up for a newsletter or a work with us button. Um, or you can just reach out to us directly. My email is Mackenzie at hashbasis.xyz. And then guess yeah, probably the best place to reach me. Mine's just Courtney at hashbasis.xyz. And we have our socials on our website as well. So you can follow us there. So I dropped hashbasis.xyz in the chat so you guys can copy that over. Um, thank you so much for your time today. I, I wanted to just ask the audience if there are any topics you'd like to request that we dive into for the next Crypto 101 training. So this is happening monthly. Um, if you have any suggestions or if you have anything you'd like us to go uh, deep dive and simplify at the same time um, into drop drop those suggestions in the Q&A or find us on social media and drop those uh, in in a message to us. Um, I also wanted to do just some housekeeping um, and let everyone know that in addition to this monthly uh, Crypto 101 training, I also host the Bitwave Basic Certification Training Course. And that is a four-part training series uh, to get you certified in what we call Bitwaving. So crypto accounting is, is complex and our platform helps to solve that. So during our training, we'll go in depth into how to use the Bitwave platform to capture on-chain data so that you can do your day-to-day -day bookkeeping and perform month and close. And we have integrations directly into our most popular, uh, the most popular ERP solutions out there like QuickBooks, NetSuite, and Sage. Um, so we'll be releasing the Q2 training dates here soon. Keep an eye out on our social media because that's where it's going to be released. But if there are no other questions, I appreciate everyone for hopping on for this training. I appreciate you, Courtney and Mackenzie. Thank you so much for hopping on to this. This was awesome. Of course. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Jenny. Great. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>